so thank you all for coming. My name is Alexei Soshin and today we're going to talk about concurrent design patterns in Kotlin. Uh, a little bit about myself. Currently I'm a staff engineer at Deliveroo. Uh, previously I was a software architect at Get for a few years. And uh, as Pablo mentioned, I'm also author of uh, Hands-On Design Patterns with Kotlin book. Uh, I know the name is a bit mouthful. And that's my Twitter link if you like to follow me. Uh, okay, so the goal of this talk, uh, first of all, uh, we'll get uh, familiar with about half a dozen of uh, concurrent design patterns implemented in Kotlin. Uh, then uh, we'll uh, discuss a bit how concurrency problems are solved by other languages and what Kotlin could uh, learn from that. And I'll try to convince you that uh, concurrency in Kotlin is awesome. So I, this talk, most of the audience here are Kotlin developers, I guess, so I don't need to work hard for that. Uh, a bit of an intro. Uh, so when I first started uh, talks about design patterns in Kotlin in general about two years ago, uh, it went really well. Uh, but the reason was that uh, most of my audience at that time were Java developers. So when I spoke about design patterns and I showed them this, this is the classical implementation of singleton design pattern in Java. And then I told them, hey, you can have just this. They went like, oh, wow, that's really a nice language, finally. Uh, but uh, once, uh, as we progress, more and more uh, Kotlin uh, developers actually came to Mount Talks, and for them it was very obvious. And uh, yeah, also, well, are there any uh, Scala developers today? No? Oh, okay, cool. So Scala developers are, are always a bit of a killjoy for Kotlin because they, ah, we already had objects for 10 years. Martin Noderski introduced it like uh, in uh, 2000 and something. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Kotlin learns a lot from uh, different uh, languages. So there is a talk by Andrei Breslov, the architect of Kotlin language, which is called On the Shoulders of Giants, which talks about the fact that they learned from Scala, they learned from uh, C Sharp, they learned from Groovy, from a lot of languages. So that's totally fine. Uh, but what that meant uh, with more and more Kotlin developers that are familiar with this language and work with it uh, day by day, there are no cheap tricks for me anymore, uh, no free meals, and I need to progress with my talks. So I decided that uh, uh, there are uh, more things to discuss about uh, in terms of design patterns, like concurrent design patterns, for example. Uh, but is there such a thing? Because if you read, ever read this book, it doesn't uh, mention anything about uh, concurrent design patterns. Uh, so there are a few things you need to know about this book if you read it. Uh, then you probably know it, maybe you don't remember it. But uh, this book was written back in 92, and uh, that it has only one edition, and uh, that's uh, the edition. And uh, all examples in this book are uh, either in C++ or in Smalltalk, I kid you not. Uh, so if you ever seen some examples uh, of design patterns implemented in Java, they aren't from this book. They are, were implemented by somebody else. Based on this book, but no, not in this book. And as I said, it doesn't contain all the design patterns in the world. So uh, before we continue to actual design patterns, we discussed a bit what design patterns are. Now let's discuss what concurrency is and why it's uh, a hot topic, why everybody at the conferences for the past 10 years or so speak about concurrency. Uh, so the reason is we are hitting our limits uh, currently. Uh, so we try to clock our CPUs, but there is a limit of how fast our CPUs can get. Then we add more cores to our CPUs. It means more parallelism, but uh, there is also a limit to how many cores we can add to our CPUs since we need to, to synchronize the cores. And concurrency is uh, the, then a way to optimize those resources. So I have limited uh, CPU clock. I have limited uh, CPU cores. I still want to make the maximum of what I have. And uh, that's concurrency. That's where concurrency helps me. And uh, one of the 
points I would like to address in this talk is that uh, concurrency, unlike some other problems, is hard to visualize. So for classical design patterns, we have those UMLs you may be familiar with. I wouldn't say UMLs are nice, but at least they help you understand what's going on. And with concurrency, we don't have it so much. And I'll try to address that problem too in my talk. So before we go on, uh, let's address the part what's uh, concurrency and what is parallelism. Uh, parallelism is doing many things at the same time. So you, you and me now are working in parallel. I'm speaking, you're listening, maybe you're on your phones, but we can do that because uh, we are separate entities. Concurrency, on the other hand, can be done on the same entity, and it means doing something while you wait for something else. Uh, so our brains are not parallel, but they are concurrent. So when you, for example, drive and talk on, the, on your phone, or when you uh, try to uh, li listen to somebody while uh, reading something, you aren't actually doing one or uh, the other. Your brain is constantly switching between those tasks. And now, if it processes one task while something changes with the other task, it, it may fail. Like, we, we may have a crash, which is totally unpleasant. You may spill your coffee because you, you wasn't focusing on it. Uh, so yeah, and that, that's, uh, that's part of the problem. So we are, uh, if there is one point I would uh, like you to take out of this talk, is that concurrency is an illusion. So it's an illusion that uh, we create, our brains create, but uh, we also as developers create this illusion that we can do something in the parallel while, while we actually don't do that. So, uh, first uh, point would be uh, uh, to discuss the async function and see if it's actually a design pattern. So most of you are Kotlin developers, you're uh, probably familiar with the use of async function. It uh, goes something like this. Uh, you have, uh, let's say you have uh, some user service. If it's a service, probably something from Spring. You have user ID, and then you want to make it concurrent, so you wrap it into uh, an async function. And uh, then somewhere later in your code, you invoke this function, uh, async function and you invoke await on the results to get the, the actual results. And uh, my question is, um, I wouldn't ask if it's a design pattern because all my talk is design pattern, so of course it is, but what's its name? A Kotlin compiler here can help us a bit. So if we look at the type the async function returns, it's called a deferred. So in this case, uh, we, re we are returning a string, so it's a deferred on string. And the name of this design pattern is uh, actually deferred value. So there is a concurrent design pattern that's called deferred value. And uh, you, if you're a Java developer or a Scala developer, you're familiar with the future. If you're a JavaScript developer, you're familiar with promise. Uh, they all implement uh, the same design pattern. Uh, so I worked uh, during my career a lot with uh, JavaScript developers and they uh, told me like, hey, you in Java or in Scala, you need uh, those design patterns. We don't need any of them. We never use design patterns in our work. So they are a bit wrong in, in this case. Uh, there, there are design patterns. JavaScript is also built on, on top of design patterns. Maybe you don't know their names, but they are still there. Uh, and my next question would be, OK, so there is this concurrent design pattern, but is it related to any classical design pattern, though? Then. Uh, if we dig into the documentation, the third implements a job. And in uh, documentation of a job, there is uh, this uh, beautiful uh, uh, ASCII art. I, 
hope that uh, the guy that did this ASCII art actually generated it and not sat down and typed it, uh, but who knows. And looking at this, uh, this ASCII art, you can see it's actually a state. So uh, coroutine, uh, every coroutine is a state machine. So it's a state uh, design pattern. The interesting part uh, about coroutines is uh, that it implements a state twice. Once as a coroutine itself, so coroutine has uh, different states which it's, uh, it switches between them. And uh, every time you put a piece of code inside your coroutine, Kotlin compiler also converts all this code into a state machine. So it will become a dynamic state machine. Okay, mm -hmm. some would argue with me, but I think that coroutines make everything better. And uh, to prove that, let's look at the following code. That's a code you'll uh, probably find also on the coroutine documentation page. So um, we have a main function. Inside the main function, since we want to use coroutines, we use run blocking. Then we loop uh, 100,000 times and uh, we launch, launch uh, 100,000 coroutines. Each coroutine just printing one number. So it should be pretty obvious what uh, this code does. And uh, since uh, we're using launch, since we're using uh, coroutines, it, it, it is executed concurrently. So just uh, to prove my point, This is the same code. Slow Wi-Fi. Oh, uh, but looking at the output, it's pretty weird. It's not concurrent at all. It's very sequential, actually. So what's going on with this? Uh, if we... Uh, uh, dig uh, into the code, we'll see this. So our uh, code is actually launching an event loop, event loop in Kotlin code. Uh, that's uh, very weird uh, when I saw it the first time. Uh, but it has its benefits. So the reason uh, is we see those numbers in a sequential way. It's because uh, the, uh, all the coroutines are executed by, by the same thread. So they are actually are sequential. And uh, it uh, has its benefits. Uh, so JavaScript uses uh, event loop. And the reason is that once you have uh, only single thread, you don't have multi-threading problems. So sometimes it's a very nice thing to have. Now, if uh, we dig deeper into that, we even could see the tasks. So I put uh, 100,000 coroutines, which are all waiting for a one uh, another to be executed. You could actually see the task queue of uh, this event loop uh, trying to execute them all. And the uh, event loop has a name as a design pattern. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, implementing the reactor design pattern. Uh, so, as I said, it uh, uses uh, a single thread, uh, which means uh, not exactly no concurrency uh, issues, but less concurrency issues than a multi-threaded solution. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, if uh, one of uh, my uh, tasks blocks uh, this thread, the entire world stops. So you may fami be familiar with that uh, in browsers, that browsers suddenly would uh, get stuck and not show you anything. That's when your event loop gets stuck. And uh, Node.js uh, popular made this uh, model, uh, made this design pattern very popular because yeah, it's uh, quite simple and uh, very efficient. Okay. Uh, what about this code? So it's uh, the same code from uh, before, 
I changed only one line and I used uh, the dispatcher's default now. And my question would be, does it still uses this uh, event loop? And as you see, the results are totally different now. They aren't sequential at all. Uh, we have uh, 9999 here, and we have a uh, lesser number underneath. So th this is actually running concurrently and uh, out of order. So before we progress to naming this design pattern, Let's see how it actually works. What we see here is uh, our uh, default dispatcher. And uh, since I run it on my, uh, CP uh, on my laptop, uh, it has uh, eight uh, cores. So default dispatcher will create uh, eight uh, threads. Each uh, column is a thread, and uh, each green line is a separate coroutine. So I don't have 100,000, it would be just a bit boring. I have uh, 1,000 coroutines uh, running here. And uh, you'll see a few interesting patterns in that. First, although, as you've seen, I just uh, create uh, 1,000 tasks, uh, those tasks are not uh, distributed evenly across uh, different cores. And uh, even though some cores get uh, more tasks than others, uh, they may finish before uh, those that got less tasks. So it's an uh, interesting observation that it doesn't use any kind of round robin, even though you may have expected that. So uh, the name of uh, this uh, design pattern, concurrent design pattern, is a multi-reactor. It was uh, coined for the first time, I think, by the Vertex framework. So it's a Java framework uh, created around uh, 2010 or 2011 by a, a British uh, guy, actually, Tim Fox. He worked at this time for uh, Red Hat, after that for Facebook. Incredibly smart guy. And uh, he looked at uh, the Node.js presentations, and Node.js was like the, ho the hottest topic at uh, those times. And he said to himself, wait a second, this guy, Ryan, uh, he took a language, JavaScript, and then he uh, created a runtime based on, C on some C++ libraries and uh, event loop uh, written in C++, and it uh, works uh, miracles. I'm a Java developer. Why wouldn't I do the same with Java? What prevents me? And actually nothing prevented him. So he created uh, this uh, framework. And it's, uh, if you look at the benchmarks, it's probably one, it's uh, currently one of the most performant frameworks out of all uh, the languages. So it's pretty incredible. Uh, so the benefit of uh, this uh, multi-reactor design pattern is that uh, it uses all available CPU cores. Uh, as I demonstrated, I had uh, eight uh, CPU cores, so it would create eight threads, uh, eight event loops, actually. And uh, the core routines or uh, other kinds of tasks wouldn't be spread evenly uh, across uh, those cores, but uh, that uh, shouldn't, uh, uh, that shouldn't bother you too much. What you should remember, though, that each uh, of uh, your threads are, uh, is still an event loop, uh, which uh, means that if your task is uh, very CPU intensive, you will still block your event loop. So you'll block only one event loop out of eight, let's say, but it uh, still reduces the resources you'll have. Uh, another interesting point is that uh, Go language uh, uses uh, this model for goroutines. 
so that uh, don't uh, say that uh, near uh, Go developers, it will make them incredibly angry. They think they invented something totally new. Uh, but yeah, it will uh, basically Go runtime will create a thread pool at the start of uh, your application, and then each Go routine will go to one of the threads. It's uh, the same. Okay. So as I mentioned uh, at the start of my talk, I'm a staff engineer at Deliveroo, so this example is closer to what we do. And let's say uh, we have uh, some uh, rider that works for us. Uh, and uh, we have three methods. Uh, we, have, uh, we want to build his uh, profile on the right. And uh, we build uh, his profile from uh, three different methods. Uh, get picture, get orders, which probably fetches like his uh, history of his orders, and his shifts like when uh, next he plans to work. So one of the examples, let's say that's the run times. Uh, one takes 100 milliseconds, second takes 200 milliseconds, and third takes 300 milliseconds. And uh, we can uh, just call those methods and then put them in a data class. And it will, uh, in total, take us 600 milliseconds. Uh, but as most of you are here Kotlin developers, you will say that's not the way we're, we do that in Kotlin, right? We do something like that. Uh, so since those methods are blocking, uh, we will wrap them in uh, something like an async function. And uh, then uh, we will build uh, the same profile. Uh, but uh, we will do that concurrently. So one of the mistakes I made in my previous talk is I demonstrated this example. And this example, it exists in code in production, and it's not concurrent at all. Uh, just a point of uh, always measure what you do and al always try to visualize what you do. So if you run this example, you'll see that it's still blocking as the previous one, horrible spring style stuff. and. Uh, the reason is uh, the code will await on the first line. It will take it 100 milliseconds, then on the second line, 200 more, then 300 more, and we produce the same blocking code. We just lied to ourselves. Uh, the actual way to do that concurrently is to first launch all our coroutines, and only then uh, to, uh, to await uh, for uh, the results. So, that's uh, pretty obvious. If you're uh, more experienced with Kotlin, you probably don't uh, make uh, those mistakes. But uh, yeah. And uh, my recurring question is, is this a design pattern? So it looks pretty naive, like, uh, except the concurrency problem. It's, it's pretty obvious. So before we continue, let's see what it looks like. So this is my code, and uh, you can see that I uh, ran three coroutines. Uh, they take uh, uh, almost the same time that I uh, asked them to do. And uh, here we see the results. So first uh, coroutine already completed, and second coroutine already completed, and now the third one. Uh, you may notice that the numbers are not uh, exactly precise, so that's something you also need to keep in mind while working with coroutines, that uh, si since uh, the way they are scheduled, they aren't executed precisely as you would like them to. So you, you may miss a few milliseconds here and there. So yeah, that, that's uh, what it actually looks like. And uh, you, you can also see that uh, the total time is uh, 300 milliseconds. I had to slow it down uh, by 100 uh, to actually show you the, uh, how it uh, executes. And going back uh, to the uh, design patterns, this is called a barrier design pattern. Uh, so if you worked with Java, there is a countdown latch and there is a cyclic barrier. 
uh, make sure you never use them in uh, Kotlin, uh, because uh, with coroutines at least, because they will block your event loop from before that I showed. Uh, so, um, it's, as I said, it makes sure that uh, all your uh, coroutines gather at the same point. In our case, the same point would be to generate the profile. It doesn't make, it doesn't make much sense to return half-baked prof profile, so we want uh, all uh, our coroutines to finish. And uh, yeah, and ma make sure if you decide to use uh, that design pattern, uh, make sure you actually allow uh, your coroutines to start before you gather them. Okay, uh, let's continue with some more examples. So, say uh, I, l let's say I like. Uh, funny cat pictures and I would like to scrap the lolcats site uh, for uh, those uh, pictures and I would like to do that in Kotlin. Uh, so what I would do, I probably would use uh, something like a produce function which uh, creates a coroutine and returns me a receive channel and uh, then inside uh, this function I'll uh, fetch the HTML then I'll parse this HTML, get the SRCs of uh, those images, and uh, I'll send those SRCs over the channel for somebody else to download them. So that's also something you probably did in your code uh, a couple of times. And my usual question is, what's the name of this design pattern? Okay, so it's an actor. Uh, although it's uh, called produce, it's actually an actor. And uh, two main features of uh, an actor design pattern is that it encapsulates concurrency and it communicates using message queues. So our concurrency encapsulation mechanism is a coroutine in this case, and our message queue is the receive channel. Uh, if you read the, the if you read the literature about actors and the actor design pattern, uh, a lot of times it will mention that actors are using uh, mailboxes instead of uh, word channels. Uh, and uh, there are also a lot of times uh, uh, they will use uh, incoming uh, mailbox and outgoing mailbox. In our case, we have only one channel, only the outgoing mailbox. Uh, but having two mailboxes is not a requirement to implement an actor. You can have an actor which is, uh, has only one mailbox. Uh, this model is uh, used uh, by Erlang. It, uh, Erlang made it uh, viable, I would say. And so I cannot say Erlang is very popular language, but it has uh, its uh, uses. Uh, so if I showed you the uh, complementary function to the produce, which is actor, you, will, you would uh, have easily guessed that it's an actor design pattern. Uh, there's also discussions, uh, uh, there are also some discussions on uh, the Kotlin forms about whether it's actually an actor, because actors a lot of times also speak about uh, supervising. Uh, if I launch another, uh, another actor from my actor, I would expect it to report to me and I would expect to be able to recreate it. That's what Erlang does and that's what also the ACA uh, framework in Scala does. But uh, you can have those actors, call them lightweight actors and still uh, the, uh, make, make use of them and we'll see that in the next examples. Okay, so we'll continue with our example. Uh, in the, the previous uh, slide, I uh, produced uh, some uh, SRCs, some links, and now I would like to download them. Uh, so I could uh, do that uh, sequentially, so have uh, one coroutine reading from this channel and just downloading them, but of course I want to get my pictures as uh, fast as possible, as concurrently as possible. I have, let's say, 1,000 pictures there. So instead of uh, having only one downloader, I, I'll, I'll create a couple of them. 
So here I generate the downloaders and then my downloader may look something like this. So it has a receive channel which it got from uh, Maria producer and then it just loops over the channel, gets uh, the uh, byte arrays from the images and probably do, doing something else with it. So is that a design pattern though? Yeah, uh, this part is called fan out design pattern. So it allows me to distribute uh, work uh, across uh, multiple actors. We have a producer which generates the work. My work is uh, downloading the pictures. And uh, uh, I have actors which will uh, uh, ac actually download them into memory. And the great benefit of uh, this uh, design pattern is that uh, allow allows our code to scale easily. Uh, I'll uh, demonstrate it later, what, but what it means, I can uh, upscale or downscale without changing anything in my implementation. Uh, let's say I have uh, eight uh, CPU cores currently on my laptop, so I can create uh, eight actors to, uh, that would download those images. If I decide that they overload my CPU, I can reduce the number to two. Then I could decide to increase them back to 16, let's say. And it's all a matter of configuration. So it's uh, very flexible and very scalable. I can make use of all the available hardware. And uh, I downloaded those images to my memory. Now I would like to save them to disk of my laptop. Uh, we could say that uh, our uh, previous uh, actor uh, also saves them, uh, writes them to disk. But first, it's not so concurrent and also it doesn't uh, provide us with a good separation of concerns. So what I would do is I would introduce another actor. Let's call it saver and this time I'll use, uh, actually use the actor function from Kotlin and it will again loop over the channel and each message it gets from a channel it will save to disk. Now uh, after introducing uh, those uh, three let's, let's see what it looks like. I'm always a bit afraid to demonstrate that because uh, previous examples uh, are uh, not done in real time. This is done in real time. So I have a Kator server uh, running and it uh, produces uh, messages and uh, produces uh, those uh, downloaders. And uh, each of them is uh, communicating with uh, JavaScript frontend uh, using a WebSocket. So each time I produce or consume a message, I also send uh, another, I replicate this message over a WebSocket for, uh, for me to visualize this. So that's uh, how it works. Uh, as you can see, the uh, time it takes to produce the URLs is, uh, um, producing URLs is much faster than uh, actually downloading them. That's the reason those are moving very fast and uh, those are m moving quite slowly. And as I said, I also distributed the work across all of my available CPUs. So I have, uh, uh, so here I have uh, eight of them. And I have only, only one image saver. Uh, writing to this is actually quite fast. After we've seen that, Let's name this. And uh, the last uh, design pattern is uh, called fan-in. So it allows us to gather uh, results from multiple sources. In our case, it's the, the, one, the downloading actors. And uh, its great benefit is uh, that it's, it is also decoupled, totally decoupled from producers. So it doesn't matter if I have only one actor that downloads my images or I have 
10 or I have 1,000. I can have as many producers as I need. I can uh, increase their number or decrease their number, and it's all done in configuration. So before progressing to the summary, I must say that I lied to you a bit. And to correct that lie, I'll show you this again. So first of all, if you look at that now, hopefully you can see, actually see what, uh, why it's called uh, fan in and fan out. So this is the part that fans out, and this is the part that fans in. So those are two uh, design concurrent design patterns that complement each other. But looking at this visualization, uh, you may think that uh, uh, there are actually 16 channels involved. And looking at my code, you'll see that there are only two. So let's fix that with another visualization. And yeah. That, that's the more, t more correct way to, uh, to visualize it. So it doesn't look much like a fan now, uh, but at least it's correct. So we have one channel, uh, which all of our uh, downloaders are connected to, and then we have uh, another channel that, that they all produce on. And that's on the, our entire architecture. So, to summarize. As I said, uh, design patterns are everywhere. You probably have uh, implemented them many times without even knowing what, uh, uh, what are they called. Uh, they aren't limited to the Gengo 4 book. There are many more design patterns that we use uh, in our development. Uh, different programming languages uh, use uh, different concurrency models and different design patterns to get uh, the job done. So we discussed uh, Node.js with its event loop. Uh, we discussed Erlang with its actors. We discussed Go that uh, uses uh, Go, Go routines and multi-reactor. And I think one of the great things about the Kotlin languages, uh, language is that uh, it's uh, not opinionated and it incorporates numerous uh, concurrent design patterns, concurrency models into the same language. So we've seen that you can use event loop if you have a good reason to, you can have uh, a multi-reactor and that's the default implementation uh, for, go, uh, for coroutines. Uh, you can easily implement actors and that's all in the same language. That's pretty awesome in my opinion. Uh, so, few references. Uh, if you're interested in the classical design patterns, I wouldn't recommend uh, the uh, original book. It's quite hard to read uh, nowadays, I would say. Head first uh, design patterns, though, is excellent. Uh, that's uh, the link to my book. It also covers the concurrent design patterns in the last chapters. And uh, that's uh, the link to the GitHub repo if you would like to see how this code works. On th one thing I need to mention that Kotlin code is uh, written okay -ish. Don't look too much into my JavaScript code. It's pretty awful. Uh, so yeah, it's n nothing fancy, just vanilla JavaScript. I was just trying to visualize that. Pretty horrible stuff. Uh, if you would like to follow me, so there's Twitter and also GitHub link. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm staying here. I'll also be until the end of the conference, so just feel free to come and ask me any questions. Thank you very much.